Alright guys, welcome to Apes, you Gerstern Dirty Apes. Um, we're going to go ahead and go through the first half of the chapter. I'll give you a stopping point to where the first uh, five pages at for this one time. But after that, you'll kind of have to just use your judgment. Um, watch this and look at the headers in your textbook and try to see if you can take notes over things that um, maybe you didn't catch when you were doing notes on your own and see if I make a good point about something, go ahead and add it if you can, all right? All right, so here we go. I'm gonna go through it kind of quickly because you can slow this down um, as much as you want. You can reverse it, rewind it, whatever. You can turn it off, turn off the volume and just watch the subtitles, uh, just whatever. All right, so what is environmental science? Um, that's what we're gonna figure out after reading this part of the PowerPoint here. Um, we're going to look at its importance, and we're going to identify ways that humans interact with the environment to alter it. Okay, there are lots of ways that we do that, not just um, you know strangling a dolphin or something like that. There, there are things that we do by the very merit of living our lives. Um, we interact with the environment, whether that's through agriculture, whether that's through mineral resource mining, whether that's through just um, clearing land to habitat to habitate. You know, all those things um, are ways that we manipulate the environment. And so we're going to have to look at what the definition of the environment is and all those things. All right. So what is the environment? The sum of all conditions surrounding us that influence life, right? So all conditions. All right. Environmental science is a field that looks at interactions among humans and those found in nature. And an ecosystem is a particular location on Earth with interacting biotic and abiotic components. So I want you to think, what is bio mean? That is living, right? This is living, living, living. And of course, abiotic, a means without, right? So I'm just going to do like a little abbreviation here. So that's without life, right? Okay, so just keep those things in mind. So the ecosystem could be rocks. It could be fish. It could be little doggies. It could be, what else? Like the air, the, the, the components, the molecules that are in the air. So all those things would be considered part of the ecosystem because obviously you have different um, things depending on where you go, right? So if I'm on land, you know, definitely have a lot of O2 that I'm breathing in, nitrogen gases perhaps, but maybe not as much um, free oxygen molecules that I can breathe if I'm underwater, right? So it's a little bit different. All right, so biotic living, abiotic non-living. Environmentalists, so you've heard of these people, the tree huggers and stuff like that. We should all um, go outside and hug a tree sometime. You know, it's a, no, I'm just kidding. All right, environmentalist, a person who partakes in environmentalism, a social movement that seeks to protect the environment through lobbying, activism, and education. And the part of our lab that we did this week with our ecological footprint, um, the final question that we had where it's like to devise a plan that you could help inform somebody not in this apes class, um, ways that you can cut down on your footprint, um, that is a method of education. That is a method of education. Okay, so if you're ever answering a question about what are some ways that people can reduce blank, um, one of the possible answers you can always give is education. The answer is always, always, always education. Okay, environmental studies, on the other hand, is a field of study that includes environmental science and additional subjects such as environmental policy, economics, literature, and ethics. Okay, just notice here that the difference between somebody who's like an environmentalist and an environmental scientist is that. Um, one of them is about activism, lobbying, so politics. So this is politics right here, right? An environmental scientist or somebody who studies environmental science is going to be more interested in, in um, looking at um, provable scientific ideas within the environment, okay? Now, an environmental scientist may contribute to the fervor and zeal of an environmentalist when they come out with studies, right? So maybe 50 years ago, we really didn't know much about uh, maybe lead, right? We didn't know like the effects of lead on the human body and how inundated it was in all of our plumbing and paint and you, know, you name it, there was lead in it. You know, so but as soon as environmental scientists focused on these studies, you know, not necessarily like having a bias. In fact, there's a really interesting video I want to show you about um, discovering lead, and it had nothing to do with some hippie trying to fit you, say that lead was bad. You know, it was just a byproduct of another experiment. And it led to a great discovery about how dangerous lead was. And so environmentalists will take those studies and then go into lobbying, get into politics, protect the environment and human beings sometimes, and well as being activated and educate the population about it. Right? All right, so what is encompassed in environmental science? This is a graphic that you probably really want to have. Ooh, okay. 
So look at that right there. I'm not going to talk too, too much about it. But just keep in, just basically speaking, we talked about this before. Environmental science is very broad. Um, you can imagine that if it is a science, um, it probably could be included in environmental science. And that includes things like ethics, literature and writing, stuff that you've taken before, right? A little bit of politics and economics. Toxicology, and this is a fun part of the year, looking for what... Um, Things kind of interact together and create lethal interactions within biological biological organisms, right? right? So environmental studies, many disciplines, okay, many, many, many disciplines. All right, humans alter natural systems. Humans manipulate their environment more than any other species. Okay? So that's one of the things that you can um, differentiate with humans. And when we say that something is human-caused, we usually call that... Um, centered around humans or, or, or pertaining to humans. And the word for humans in Greek, anthropos, and then centered around would be centric. So anthropocentric, anthropocentric. Anthropocentric is human-made or human, human source. All right. So now we're going to look at environmental indicators and look at sustainability for the human race, okay? All right, very, very important. You're going to see me talk about this all year long, the idea of ecosystem services, the processes by which life-supporting resources such as clean water, timber, fisheries, agricultural crops are produced. And it's more than just that, too. Um, things like flood control because of, like, mangrove trees and uh, wetlands um, are also ecosystem services. Those are things that would take the place of us having to build, like, a, like a seawall or something like that. Um, all those things are very, very important because they save humans the, the effort of having to do that. They provide a very important service for us. And since it's from the ecosystem and not man-made, we call that an ecosystem service. Can you think of a few ways that animals or plants or something provide an ecosystem service? I mean, if you take any medications or you have a family that takes medications, um, you bet your bottom dollar that at some point it probably came from some sort of plant, okay? Now, an environmental indicator is something that describes the current state of the environmental system, right? They're things that we can look at. They're um, categories of things in the, in the environment that we look at, and then we make judgments based on the data as to the health of the environment, okay? So think about some things that we might want to look at, right? Um, if you go to the doctor and the doctor wants to do a checkup on you and do an indication of your health, they might check your temperature, they might look at maybe the back of your throat and shine the light in and you go, ah, right? They might look in your ear, they might look at your skin snap, right? If you're going to do um, something like that, they might take a blood test, right, and see if your blood platelets are low, high, they might look at white blood cell count, they might look at um, cholesterol. So all those things would be um, human health indicators, right? So we're going to look at things that would be environmental indicators. All right, so I'm not going to talk too, too much at length about this. You just need to kind of look at these. But we're going to, there is a chapter for each one of these things and then some. So biological diversity. So biological living things, diversity means a, a variety, right? A really large variety. It turns out that a lot of variety of biological organisms in, a, in an area um, is a healthy thing. All right, and we'll, and we'll get into the, the specifics of that later on in the year. Okay. Food production. Um, so looking at the amount of food that human beings are producing could mean that there is a suitable enough environment for humans to live in and thrive in. So that therefore, that means we're eating a lot of food. But on the other hand, if we're looking at the environment, because human beings are not really considered part of the environment when you're doing apes a lot of the times. Like we're considered human, um, like human effects, not environmental effects. So I know that's kind of confusing, but you'll see as we go into this year, that you don't really want to mingle the idea of human beings and being part of the environment, even though we affect the environment. But food production increasing might mean that we're taking away land that was originally forest, right? So increased food production might be a negative indicator of how the environment's doing. So just kind of keep that in mind. All right. So you see here, this may affect the number of, that, uh, of people Earth can support. So if we have low food production... We're looking at a decrease of human populations. All right, indicator, average global surface temperature and CO2 concentration, and this all has to do with global warming. 
and probably detrimental. And if you look at um, the coast right now in Houston, and today we just started having these almost like a gas war going on. So we're having like shortages. Um, these are things that are related to the storm. And these tropical storms and hurricanes really, really, really like warm water, right? It lets them go further, further up on inland, and they don't break up. So we're going to have more intense storms more frequently. So this is an effect of, of global warming, right? So that's something to think about. So the human population itself um, has a negative impact on the environment because we manipulate it more than anything else, right? And then resource depletion. Okay, so read through that. An increased use of most resources has negative effects, especially things like coal and natural gas, um, things that might break down into acids when they get into the air, or, or tailings. Tailings are just little leakages that come out of, like, mining shafts and mining holes in the ground and, and things, that we, things that we build. So those things will get into lakes and streams and, and, and the soil, and they cause havoc on everything. So, so just, I mean, this is bad for us because if we run out of resources, it's bad, but the actual process of mining resources and using resources um, has an effect on the environment as well. So here's some environmental indicators again, biological diversity, food production, CO2 and temperature, human population resource. Okay, biodiversity is the diversity of life forms in the environment. Okay, and it exists on three different scales, the genetic, the inside, the species. So within, say like, um, so within a cat, like maybe if I have just one cat, um, it'll have the ingredients to make all kinds of traits, right? But they're not all expressed at the same time, right? So it has a lot of genetic diversity depending on who it mixes with in the future. But um, it does have um, some building blocks to make some other traits that it could have expressed had, you know, um, <clears throat> had the, you know, crossbreeding been a little different, right? Punnett square and all that. Okay, and on the species level, I might have a lot of different types of cats, right, of different, that express different um, traits. And then within the ecosystem, you look at many, many different types of um, species and different types of environments within the ecosystem that can support many different walks of life, right? So all these things go into the idea of biodiversity, and we're going to do like an interesting lab on how to predict the species richness and species variety. Um, just on taking a small sample of, of animals, right? So that's kind of cool. They have lots of different... All right, levels of biodiversity. Ecosystem diversity is a variety of ecosystems within the region. So you can see here, here's the idea of a lot of different regions. Okay, so this might just be on the same kind of coastal area. You've got kind of a marine tidal zone here. You've got some ecotone where you have like some plains meeting a forest so that's an ecotone right there where there's kind of like a, a blending of the two right so certain species that are adapted to live in both of these environments uh, might do well here or here but then you have like a transitional species that will do real well here then you have a mountainous region here and if you know if you remember anything from world geography um, you know that the environment on this side of the mountain is very different than on this side of the mountain right that makes sense no, maybe not, but we'll get to that later. Okay, then you have species diversity. You notice you got little mushrooms here. You got moss. You have a woodpecker, woody woodpecker. You got chipmunk, and you have a bear. Right. Remember, you only have to run faster than the friend you came with to survive a bear attack, right? Because you can't outrun a bear. All right, and then genetic diversity. You can see that lots of different traits. I hope that didn't cut off too, too badly. Sorry. All right, genetic diversity, a measure of genetic variation among individuals in a population. So populations with high genetic diversity are better able to respond to environmental change than populations with lower genetic diversity. So if you have a bunch of chipmunks that really, really like to eat red M&Ms, and then all the red M&M trees die, guess what? They all die. But if you had some uh, chipmunks that were able to eat other colors of M&Ms, a red M&M tree blight you know, that comes through and just wipes everything out, perhaps maybe from a frost or an invasive species that, you know, outcompetes the chipmunks, um, those chipmunks will be able to survive. And so that's, that's a very important thing, right? That's, you know, and later on we'll talk about why we care about these things, um, why we would care about, you know, saving chipmunks that can eat, you know, certain things. Like, why do we care? It doesn't affect me. Well, it kind of does in a way. We'll, we'll see later. Species diversity, a group of organisms that is distinct from other groups in its morphology, 
behavior or biochemical properties. So lots of different types of animals besides just chipmunks. You might have raccoons and maybe lemurs and sharks. Species diversity, the number of species in a region or particular type of habitat. Speciation, the evolution of a new species, and there are lots of ways that this can happen, right? Um, you may already be very familiar from taking biology, uh, different ways that um, Charles Darwin discovered different types of speciation around the world. Okay. Background extinction rate, the average rate at which species become extinct over the long term. And this is very, very interesting. It is interesting because um, without human beings, the natural extinction rate, the net extinction rate would be zero. Okay, So animals are moving out, and then some animal comes in and takes the niche, the niche, niche. I'm not sure how to say that word. I think it's niche. I've been saying niche for a long time. All right. So some animal will come in and take the job, the role of that animal that is now kaput, right? So a niche is just a space in which a species takes up and performs like all the jobs and interactions within that system, right? Okay, ecosystem diversity is a measure of the diversity of ecosystems and habitats that exist within a given region, and we talked about that a little bit. Okay, so now let's look at food production. So we talked about um, some environmental indicators. We look a little bit about food production, okay? Food production is our ability to grow food to nourish the human population. We use science and technology to increase the amount of food we can produce on a given area of land. And we're going to look into agricultural sciences uh, quite a bit. We're going to look at soil. We're going to look at GMOs. Um, you know, you hear a lot of things about GMOs, and for some reason you hear a lot of negative stuff, and it gets really intermingled with the idea that they can turn you into, like, a mutant or something. But that's not... Um, as you study a little bit more into apes this year... The real issues with GMOs are not necessarily biological in nature um, that we know of yet. There isn't really conclusive evidence that is done by you know, rigorous scientific studies that have been retested and, and, and blind tested and, and retested and retested and retested. Did I say that enough already? Um, it's more on the economic things that people have problems with the GMOs, right? But GMOs in general have been... Um, basically a minor miracle for a lot of different countries that are very impoverished because we have um, taken advantage of DNA modification to increase the yield or the amount we can harvest in a year so that people don't need to use up as much land, right? So we'll, we'll talk about that. And perhaps maybe our future um, energy needs might be solved by genetic engineering. So we'll talk about that later in the year. All right, in food production, it looks like it's leveling off throughout the years. You're going to have to be very familiar with reading graphs um, look at this little break in the graph right here. You know how to do that. Notice the y-axis as a title. This is your, what type of variable is this on the y-axis? This is your dependent variable. And what's it dependent on? It's dependent on the year. So depending on the year, our grain production changes, right? That's essentially what this is saying, all right? And notice the title. This title is really, really, really easy, right? So take notes of how this graph is made, right? World grain production per person. And where do they get this title from? Grain production per person, you can even put per year, right, over the years, from the year 1950 to 2010. That is a perfectly acceptable title. Um, we'll talk about how to fit this all nicely within here and how to fit this nicely in here because you don't want 2010 to end over here, right? You don't want 400 to end down here and have all this empty space because then Mr. Bannon will get mad and go, ah, why are you doing that? Because you're missing points. All right. You also want to be able to read the data and trends. You notice here, even though this is kind of squiggly, if you just kind of do a best fit curve, you can see that it's the trend is that it's leveling off, right? All right, so that's it for now. This is the first half of the chapter one. Uh, we'll come back and do chapter two in the next couple of days, and you'll watch and take notes and all that fun stuff. Yay.